This is the Blueprint Podcast, bringing you the latest in cyber defense and security operations from top Blue Team leaders. Blueprint is brought to you by the SANS Institute and is hosted by SANS Senior Instructor, John Hubbard. And now, here's your host, John Hubbard. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special Blueprint podcast season. This is the first of a series of episodes that are going to be all dedicated to security operations, and I'm incredibly excited for this. Uh, first, I want to explain what we're doing here in this brand new season. Uh, MITRE has recently released a book uh, called The 11 Strategies of a World-Class Cybersecurity Operations Center with the three authors we have uh, on the episode here throughout the season. It's one of the best free resources that is out there for building and operating a security operations center. And something that I think is going to be very, very interesting and exciting for all the listeners to hear. The first edition of this book uh, came out back in 2014, and it was something that I read and really dove into and loved a lot of the uh, the bits of wisdom and knowledge on and used as a reference for years as I was uh, kind of coming up as a SOC analyst and SOC manager. And when this new version came out, I thought this is a perfect match for what I would love to have on the podcast. And as luck had it, uh, ran into Ingrid and Carson at the Blue Team Summit in 2022. We came up with a plan to make it happen. And now here we are a couple months later, uh, starting our episode. So in this episode uh, and throughout this entire special season, we're going to have all three authors of 11 Strategy of, uh, Strategies of a World Class Cybersecurity Operations Center uh, joining us. Uh, we're going to be doing one episode per chapter, looking at different takeaways from the chapters, explaining the concepts in the book and kind of hearing everything in the author's own words. So I am ridiculously excited for this and I hope you all are too. Uh, with that, let's go to our three authors here, which we have uh, online, Kat, Ingrid, and Carson. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, to kick things off, I'd love to do a quick round of introductions. So uh, we'd love to hear a little bit about your history and InfoSec and these topics and uh, what you do now. So Kat, let's start with you, and then we'll pass it over to Ingrid, then Carson. Hey, John. Well, I'm excited to be here, too. So I'm Catherine Nerler. I've been in the cybersecurity field for a very, very long time. Um, quite near the beginning of security operations becoming a thing. So um, I've been doing, uh, you know, threat hunting and security uh, types of things for many years. Uh, currently a department manager at MITRE in cybersecurity assessments. Awesome. And Ingrid? Oh. Hey, thanks, John. So happy to be here. I am currently... Uh, right in between positions with my company, Red Canary, uh, moving from being the senior manager of intelligence over to our threat hunting team, right, as we are doing the recording. So when these come out, I'm not sure exactly what my title will be, but somewhere in that realm. I've been doing uh, IT and cybersecurity for about 25 years now. I will I will show my age there. Um, done a number of different things from actually being that hands-on analyst, you know, getting that uh, alert at you know, 3.59 on a Friday afternoon and going, oh, I know what I'm doing this weekend uh, through working with some of the largest, um, you know, U.S. federal uh, agencies, helping them to figure out kind of where they're at, where they want to go, how they want to transform their socks as they, uh, as they move into the future here. So really happy to be bringing some of that experience and hoping to share that with everybody on the podcast. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. And Carson. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm also really excited to be here. This is this is really cool. Um, I've been working in security uh, since I graduated college, actually since before that. I interned at MITRE uh, over 20 years ago. Yes, I'm old. I come by every gray hair naturally and, uh, and honestly. Um, and most of it's been in security operations. And, and you know, that's taken me different places. Um, left MITRE about six years ago. I'm at Microsoft now. Um, I'm an investigations team lead in the Microsoft Security Response Center, MSRC. Um, so that that is a very fascinating job um, defending uh, defending the cloud um, at scale. So and um, this is uh, this is going to be fun. Yeah, we got the uh, the dream team here of, of defenders. So really excited to get into this stuff. Uh, today on this episode, what we're going to be covering is chapter zero in the book, which is titled Fundamentals, uh, some stuff to kind of kick us off as we go on this journey throughout the entire book. Uh, we're going to be covering some of the core pieces of, of prepping to make the best security operations team that you can and kind of talking through the major sections of each part of the book. 
Chapter zero focuses on some things like the importance and the role of the SOC, the SOC functions, as in what is the SOC actually doing and what might you include in that and what might you not include in that or why. Uh, some of the basic things to consider as you're building up a SOC team and people process and technology and the need to do that at speed. So it's really, really important groundwork. Um, let's kick this off with a kind of just basics about the book. Uh, just so everyone's kind of familiar with why we have the second version and, and where all that came from. So I'll toss this out to really anyone who's um, wants to answer this. What inspired this new version of the book? Uh, who is it for? How should we read it? Uh, how can we approach this this new version? So I want to I'll jump into that because I was at MITRE at the time that the the book was being considered and. Uh, in my department, a few folks were, we were all talking about this because the, the first edition that Carson had written was so popular with, you know, the, our, our sponsors, with the people we worked with, we, we knew within the community. Um, but we also recognize how fast cybersecurity changes. Um, and so when we started talking about this, it, it was actually probably even like four years ago. Um, and we were starting to think, oh, yeah, you know what, it's time to do an update. You know, maybe we should do this. Um, having conversations about how we wanted to go about that. Um, you know, bringing Carson back in. Uh, he had moved over to Microsoft at that point, so figuring out how to get him uh, back into the fold. And really, we just recognized that um, we wanted to do another free resource. We we really loved the fact that it was available to everybody. You can just go get the PDF. You don't have to pay for this. You can you know download it, and it it can help people who are just getting started in cybersecurity. It can help people who are maybe you know. Uh, you know, earlier in their careers coming into it, people who are maybe transitioning from other places, you know, so whether you've been a network administrator or you've been on, maybe you've been doing vulnerability management and want to get more to the operations side or whatever you want to do in this space, you know, or even leaders that maybe are coming from a different discipline uh, and now find that a SOC is under their their purview. Um, and so really that's, that's what we want to do. We're like, okay, we want to update this. We want to uh, really make it something that is still going to be freely available and, you know, useful for everybody out in the community. Yeah, that's awesome. The um, the way it's broken down is into 11 different chapters. Is this something that you would expect people to read kind of serially from cover to cover? Or is it more of a reference book, a little bit of both? So I'll jump in on that one. Um, I, I think, you know, a, a great way to look at this is a resource or a reference. So you absolutely don't have to read starting at chapter one and going all the way through. And I think about myself, I have a hard time, you know, just opening up a book and reading the whole thing. So if you are looking at your incident response, for example, there's a chapter dedicated to that and you can go right to that chapter. So uh, the idea is to jump around just based on what you need. But of course, you can read from um, start to finish if you're brand new to a security operations. That's awesome. That's one of the things I know that I was doing for a very long time with the previous version of the book. It's super useful to have kind of as that just reference file somewhere in a folder that you can get to like, oh yeah, what was I supposed to do when this happens? Or what's the components of this other thing that maybe we're trying to build now? Really, really cool reference yeah, like, text. Exactly. Like an old school, you know, desk reference we used to call them, you know, just sitting right by you. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So starting off kind of in the beginning of chapter zero, uh, talking about fundamentals, one of the, the main sections right in the beginning is the importance and role of the SOC. So maybe we should start out our conversation kind of about the book there. Uh, in 2023, what would you say a SOC generally looks like? And why does the average business, uh, or at least people who would be listening to this, why do they need a SOC? We'll be back after a quick break. If you're enjoying this episode, then you're undoubtedly interested in building the strongest security operations team that you can. For those who want to go even deeper, did you know that SANS has not one, but two courses that cover security operations centers as well? For the leaders, managers, and directors out there, my co-author Mark Orlando and I offer 551, Building and Leading Security Operations Centers. This course covers building your team, your physical and virtual workspace, getting the right data into your tools, and then focusing on security priorities through everyday execution of important security tasks and building the best SOC team possible. For the technical practitioners out there, my course SEC 450, Blue Team Fundamentals, Security Operations and Analysis, is designed to cover everything you need to jump in being the best SOC analyst that you can be. We cover important data types, SOC tools, security logs, malware, analysis technique, automation, and much, much more. 
In addition, if you want to prove you can deliver the best on any security team, both courses have an accompanying certification available from GIAC. That's the GSOM for 551 and the GSOC for 450. Check out both courses and free demos available on the SANS website. You can get registered today for an in-person course at one of our many events, or go to On Demand and take either class anywhere at your own pace. Thanks for listening. We're probably all hesitating because there is no single answer to what a sock looks like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I threw that out knowing that would be part of the answer. <laughs> I'll, I'll offer a, a couple a couple points. And I want to go back to one of the questions you asked, John, because I think it pertains to this one as, as well as, you know, why did why did I sit down, you know, 10 years ago and say, I should I should write a book. I should spend 842 hours doing this thing because I didn't know how long it was going to take and ended up taking that that long, uh, what an adventure. And one of the reasons why I chose to embark on this process. And I think one of the reasons why we did it again was that there is such a, there was at least at the time, a lack of common understanding across so many people, even in the industry about what does it mean to do security operations? Well, or for that matter, um, what does a sock look like? And originally you know, the first edition was going to be a reference mainly for MITRE sponsors, which is MITRE speak for MITRE's customers, which is mainly the U.S. federal government. And and it was almost like hash, what we would now say, hashtag YOLO. Like, I'm like, I'm just going to write this down and I'm going to see if people agree with me or not. And I got really lucky. Most almost everybody agreed with me. And then and then when we were doing second edition, Ingrid, Catherine and I had a bunch of very interesting conversations about what would change. We'll get to that perhaps later. And one of the most difficult things when I was first writing the first edition and and the beginning of it, I was like, how do I define a sock? What is a sock? Like, what are the most quintessential things that a sock does? Because there's so many different sizes. And that's one of the things, you know, when we get to some of the other chapters, like chapter three, we'll talk about the different shapes and sizes. So you know, we put definitions in, in there and we could, we could quote ourselves if we really wanted. Um, but you know, even when I started going back to like the original definition from an old RFC about what is a CSERT, uh, a computer security incident response center or team, uh, depending on your favorite acronym, the definition there was, you know, a, P, a set of, of people who have come together to, uh, take incident reports and then do something about them. Um, and even now I find some socks who don't do that. (laughs) They only do half of that and they're still called a sock. So, you know, it's really kind of, it's kind of fuzzy. Um, it's almost like, you know, the probability that as associated with an electron orbit, like wherever you are, you're like, there's some percentage you might be within a sock or not. And these, (laughs) it's just, there's so many shapes and sizes. Yeah. And it's, it's fuzzy to, to build on that, but what's clear is there's a threat. Right. So yeah. what we all know is we have these threats and that's why you need a sock if you want the simple answer. If we didn't have threats, if we didn't have adversaries or insider threats or things happening to our networks and d- data and applications, you wouldn't need a sock. But since we all have these wonderful things, um, we need a security operations to help out with that. Yeah. So maybe we can loosely define it as the group of people that's going to prevent bad things from happening via the cyber realm. Or <laughs> to respond some extent, to them. Right? Yeah. And respond to them as well. Right. Yeah. That, that, I would say like in my general discussions I have, that's kind of the core of the job with a whole lot of if ands and other things that may or may not be thrown into that, which we'll totally get into once we talk functions. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to clarify before we get too deep into this is the name SOC. You mentioned C-CERT. Mm. I've seen CERT, C-CERT, DART, SOC. Are those different in your minds? Or is this just the group of people that does the things that we just talked about? The names in the names can be used interchangeably, but they do tend to appear in different places. Like at a national level, you're more likely to see something like a CERT, a, a you know, cybersecurity, you know, or CSERT, cybersecurity incident response team. Um, SOC tends to be used, I think, a little bit more in uh, kind of smaller to mid-sized organizations or non-governmental organizations. Um, you also run into people who talk about the NOC, the Network Operations Center, which is a, a separate function in terms of keeping the lights on and keeping things running versus the security of everything. But sometimes you get a NOSC, which is a combination of those two. So you get the network and the security piece. Um, so 
I, I've at least noticed that it does tend to kind of depend um, the level that you're at. And it also can depend internationally. I think we use SOC a lot more here in the US, but we've heard that other terms are more common in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So definitely something that can be thought of kind of interchangeably to some degree, but don't let the you know definitions, yeah. I guess, fool you. It's still kind of those group of people doing cyber defense in a general sense, at least, right? Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll add a couple of things there. I you know, we wrangled with this, right? What do we call this? In fact, when I, when I was still scrolling now, you know, first edition manuscript, uh, originally it was, it, I used the word CSER. <laughs> and I remember when I had to go do a global find and replace for CSER <laughs> with SOC in the book. And the reason, the reason why I think we originally landed on the term SOC was that we felt it was going to be the most meaningful word to the audience, um, and one of the points I'll address, which we'll talk about when we get there is when people hear the word sock, they think, uh, physical operation center with people staring at glass and big visualizations and whatnot. And one of the questions I think probably all three of us get is, you know, do you need a physical sock or does sock mean physical place? And, and the answer today is no, it might've been different 10 years ago. Um, I don't mean to dwell on it here, but it is relevant. So why am I bringing this up is, is when we say SOC, we mean a group of, of people who have been assembled to do this stuff, not necessarily their physical location or the requirement that there is a physical place to do it. Yeah, especially after COVID, I'm finding in classes that a lot of people no longer have that room. And it's a loose knit, you know, well, not loose knit. It's a tightly grouped, but physically disparate group of people kind of all over earth, kind of working towards a common goal with no room that they will ever sit in together potentially. So, um, yeah, definitely, definitely important thing to point out there that doesn't have to be the movie sock, although that's cool, right? When you have those things, right. Uh, definitely not always that kind of a situation. So one of the other things, uh, early on in chapter zero is the section on the mission of the sock. Once a business has decided, yes, we have cyber threats, we need to make a group that can help remedy the threats uh, and, and all the risk that they're potentially posed to us. Um, how do they go about deciding and defining what the mission of these group of people is going to be? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think the, the biggest thing we can say here is that it's not a one size fits all. You really have to look at what are all the different things that you do what are the business or missions that you're looking at to protecting and defending? Um, and, you know, how big is it geographically uh, dispersed? You know, there's, is it bigger than a red box? Do I only need two people or do I need a hundred? Um, there's a lot of factors that go into this and I'll hand it over. And, and we're getting into this a little bit when we get into strategy one, know what you're protecting and why, you know, and understanding that mission. But it really is um, sitting down between the, the security people and the leadership and having that discussion about what they are trying to protect. What are you actually like the SOC is not for most businesses is not their mission. And even for those organizations that are doing security operations as their job, they will also still have an internal team that is protecting that organization. And so you really have to figure out what it is you're trying to protect, why you're trying to protect it. Um, and then align the functions that the SOC is doing to be able to optimize how you're doing that piece. Is this a, a mission, right? Is that something that you would have like in a single clarified statement somewhere? Or is that more a general sense of like the scope of the job, the assets that they're protecting, but not like a, a one, you know, like a mantra or something like that, right? Uh, is it one succinct thing or is it kind of the whole concept of operations and everything else in the way that you're using it here? I, you know, I think, I think the, the, when getting a crisp mission statement written down for the SOC or, or, a, or a set of services or a set of functions, whatever they may be, getting that written down really helps. Um, and it, it helps for the SOC itself. It helps for its customers. It helps for its executives, right? And we, and we go into that in, in a little bit more depth in, in strategies, I think, two and, and three. Um, one of the themes I will... I'll reiterate um, many times throughout all this is that the sock at almost every layer of abstraction is engaged in this breadth versus depth trade-off at literally every, and, and Ingrid opened with this, you know, when she presented she uh, the overview of the book uh, at, at the Sands Blue Team Summit last year. 
Um, and it, it goes all the way from deciding your mission scope to, am I done with this incident or not? And everything in between. In fact, when we talk about what is the SOC going to do, it's, it's an inverted and weird conversation because oftentimes it is a function of how many people and how much tech did we throw at the problem and less about a deliberate decision on what are we going to go do. And, and usually it's kind of like you meet in the middle and you figure it out because as you go on and you get better at it, you can you see more and you do more. And it's this weird experience where you're never done and you're never done and you're never complete. And you never feel like you're doing it all because, you know, the, the goalpost keeps moving and you'll see us talk about that a lot. Yeah. And um, just back to the the mission statement, coming up with the mission statement is, you know, the thing about a SOC is it's operating in context of a larger organization. And so you may already have an IT organization that's doing things like, I don't know, vulnerability management and some of the basic things. And so the SOC has to figure out the mission part for them and how they fit in with the IT organization. Ingrid mentioned a NOC, you know, a, a network operating center, same thing. So if you have a NOC, and you're forming a SOC, it's real important to have that coordination together. Yeah. So it's a little bit of what do you have the ability to do? What do you wish you could do? And then where those kind of Venn diagrams over or the circles for the Venn diagram overlap, like that's what we'll do. But that definition may, you know, adjust over time as the team grows or shrinks, or you get into different projects or other various needs uh, for the business. Um, one thing I know you all wanted to discuss uh, early on in this is the importance of definitions throughout the team and throughout kind of your mission statement and everything else. Um, how would you phrase that conversation? And what is, what is the importance of everyone kind of being on the same page when it comes to definitions of terms and everything else in the SOC? I, that was one of the things I was thinking about as we were prepping for this is, you know, we just, we just had the discussion on what is a SOC. I mean, at the very top level, you're having this question about, you know, how are you defining your team? And then you start going from there and you look around and there's, um, you know, there are a number of publications out there who have put definitions down, but they all have slightly different variations to them. And so, um, you know, how much is the SOC responsible for the protection versus, you know, the, the response? Does the SOC actually do the incident response portion or is there another team that even gets involved with that? And so um, at the very top level, you're having to do these definitions to say, okay, what's in, what's out of scope, back to that mission statement. And then you start getting down into those terms of, um, you know, we were all just chatting about this before we even got started today. You know, what's an alert? What's an event? What's an incident? How do you how do you define those? Um, and you see this throughout marketing language. You see this in different textbooks. You see this just in terms within the community. And if you know, if people are saying, "Hey, this is an event," um, and by event I mean, you know, this is just an observable that I have in my environment, and somebody else says, "I have an event," and to them, an event actually means an incident, like something that they seriously need to go investigate. That's a very different concept of what you need to do with that piece of information. And so we put, um, you know, we put some definitions in the book based on our experiences and some things that, especially if you're newer, you could start from, but it is really important that you as an organization agree to what those terms are so that as you are talking amongst yourself, as you're talking to leadership, as you're talking to your vendors, like you are putting that in the same context. Otherwise you could be talking about one thing versus 10,000 things uh, and have a very different impression of what's actually going on. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's exactly what I find too in class. And I usually have a moment where I'm like, I put a poll literally in like our Slack chat room and I say, hey, everyone, let me know roughly how many alerts you get per day. And by then I've already like defined alert as something that might be bad. And I get everything from 2 million plus to 10 or below. Mm. And I'm like, clearly even the word alert, even when we already define it, means different things to different people. Some people mean aggregated alerts. Some people mean the raw like output of their IDS or whatever it is. So um, that's one thing I wanted to call out, you know, as we go through these conversations, we'll be sure to uh, define what we mean by those uh, terms as we hit them. So everyone's very clear about what what it is we're referring to when we get to that. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll, oh, add, I'll add one real quick thing to that is, is, is you know, people often think, oh, this is going to come up at the beginning, right? And when we're forming the SOC or when we're just opening this up. And I'm here to tell you that I run into people who have been doing this stuff longer than I have, who will sit there and have an argument about like, what does false positive mean? And oftentimes, <laughs> you know, just like Ingrid was saying, it's it's contextual and it's objective de de dependent and people like like time to whatever metrics, like it depends on what your perspective and your objective is. Um, and that's actually 
this is one of a bazillion of examples of why, why is the book free? The book is, is free for a lot of reasons. One of them is, is it's more valuable to me. I would suspect it's the, tr- the same is true for Ingrid and Catherine. It's more valuable t- to me for the book to be free and available so that when people are having these conversations about anything, including the basic definitions, they have this as a reference they can share and haggle over. And our definitions may not be right, but they're at least based on A, what we saw out there and and synthesizing those experiences together. Yeah, it puts kind of a stake in the ground and says like, maybe it's not 100% perfect, but it's 95% of the way there. And at least kind of we know what this thing means when it says this, right? right Same thing with like MITRE's, you know, attack framework, right? That's another reason I think that's great is like, it is a common language for everyone to use. And whether you disagree with it or not, that's one thing. But like, um, when we say groups, as it relates to MITRE attack, like everyone knows kind of what that means, right? And it just makes communication easier between everyone. So yeah, I think clarification of terms is one thing just from the start, every team has to be very, very clear on. Uh, love that point, Ingrid. So thank you very much for, for uh, bringing up that part of the conversation before we even get into this. Yeah. And to the extent possible, I should point out that we spent a lot of time try to, trying to use the most widely referenceable definitions and concepts um, from wherever they came from. So uh, we pointed all over the place. We were really agnostic to where things came from or who was using them. It's just, are these things widely used? Perfect. Yeah. So that'll be really, really useful as we go through this. So getting into kind of, uh, I would say the core part of chapter zero and the fundamentals, one of the biggest kind of sets of pages in that chapter is all about the sock functions as they're called. And this is a big Pandora's box of a conversation, right? <laughs> but this is something that I also find that students are like always asking about. It's, it's very, very uh, hotly debated, like what should be part of the sock? And that's kind of the list in this book, uh, as I interpret it, of like, here's the things you might put in your sock. So let's start with some of the categories. Uh, what are the things that you have seen included in a sock? And then after that, we'll get into uh, what are the priorities and how would you decide and things like that. But what what might be included in, in a sock under some definitions? And I want to say you're getting big smiles from all of us because this set of tables was the most challenging for all of us that we went back to. And this was actually, we did it right in the beginning. And this was the last thing we touched when we were finishing up the book. And we actually went back and made a bunch of changes. I, I, I have an, all right. I actually have an offer a short story because it, it speaks to like three of the questions you've asked originally. Um, so I had the table from the first edition and obviously we needed to update it. And, and, and I think Ingrid asked, she's like, so what should we do? Like we were just getting started on writing the second edition. Like, what should we do? And my immediate like knee jerk reaction was, oh, just to pull the set of functions from first. It's good. And, and for, and lots of people respect first, first.org. And we'll just use that. And then, and she's like, are you sure? And then I, I started reading it and I'm like, and I, then I said, no. And the reason why I said no is and this goes back to scope and intent is the scope and intent of writing this set of functions down was not just what people who are customers of the SOC see, but it's there in part to support a meaningful conversation about how is the SOC spending its resources and some of the ways it spends those resources aren't necessarily externally visible or visible to everyone. I'll give you one just random example is the tool and engineering administration functions, right? It's a, it's a very meaningful conversation to have about, are we doing this or don't we, but, or hunt, but it may not be ex- visible to others. So that's just, you know, being very meta about this. I wanted to point that out. So just to clarify, first.org, it's a forum of incident response team. So shout out to those folks that's been around since the late eighties. You know, uh, we started with that actually. Yep. And then we moved from there. Big shouts. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <clears throat> and and I think some of the, the areas where we really felt like we wanted to add on to that was thinking about CTI, thinking about uh, you know hunting analytics, how that has really become you know so core to the SOC advancing itself. You know, not just saying, hey, we're gonna use a tool out of the box and accept what's there, but really um, building your own analytics, figuring out how to, you know, learn from your own environment and improve that over time, and then bringing in that threat intelligence and and making sure that that's going to uh, really inform how your SOC is operating. And then Carson touched on this a little bit, but 
um, that engineering piece, you know, within the SOC, um, sometimes SOCs do this themselves. They are responsible for their own architecture, their own engineering, their own integration. Um, sometimes you have to partner with another organization. Um, you know, so you might have an IT organization that actually does this for you, but understanding that these are things that have to happen. And then you can have those discussions within your organization, within your constituency about who actually owns this. So this list is really long. Um, but the, and these are all things that ideally you want to do, but it wasn't to be, Hey, your sock has to do this. It's really, what are your boundaries? And if you're not the one that owns this, who does own it? How do you make sure they're doing that for you? And how do you create those relationships and those connections so that you're getting that function to enable the SOC? Um, and so that's really what we look at this and say, okay, uh, you know, who's going to manage the SOC enclave? Okay, somebody has to do that and make sure it's taken care of, um, no matter who who does that. So uh, yeah, have, have seen SOCs with all of this, but not uh, not necessarily a requirement. Yeah. So I mentioned vulnerability management earlier. Um, that's been a real hot topic over the last year, the connection between a security operations center and vulnerability management. Traditionally, in large organizations, something like vulnerability management is done in the IT organization. What we found is, you know, when we have these giant events like solar winds and, you know, these big incidents that hit a multitude of places and people and things, um, the vulnerability management team didn't necessarily get the word uh, in a in a timely way from the security operations and vice versa. You know, they knew about a vulnerability, perhaps the security operations team needs to to have it. So that's just a real concrete example of what what we've been talking about with security functions for the SOC. Yeah. So in your list here, you've got, you know, triage, IR and analysis. I think anyone would agree like those are pretty core to the cyber defense kind of working in a SOC experience. Uh, there's CTI hunting and analytics, uh, still pretty related, but CTI maybe in my mind at least gets a little bit further in terms of the skill set, right? Like most people are not going to be a, a threat intelligence expert and a SOC analyst expert and in, in all of those skills, right? That becomes a little bit too much for one person. But the detection engineering piece of that, threat hunting, those are still in my mind at least very, very closely related to what a SOC analyst as a job role in many cases are going to be doing. Uh, you also get into deception and insider threat and attack simulation, vulnerability management, pen testing, red teaming, kind of all that stuff is in there. Uh, situational awareness, comms, leadership, management. Um, when people, and acknowledging, right, that any of these may or may not be under the SOC umbrella, are there any signs uh, that someone might be looking for that may give them the hint that like, oh, maybe vuln management should be under the same management as as the SOC, or maybe they shouldn't be. Like, mm. what what are the signifiers that you got it wrong? There, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of pieces to this. I, I mean, I've been having conversations with people about you know what aspects of vuln management belong in the SOC and don't. You know, as recently as just a couple weeks ago, and. You know, someone approached me after a talk I gave at a conference recently and kind of asked me about this. And it's kind of this it's this kind of weird, awkward conversation about where you draw the line, because there's no perfect answer. Let me give you some some very concrete examples. Um, everyone is in agreement that there needs to be an apparatus somewhere in the enterprise that does things like routine vulnerability scanning, you know, giving the the results out and then kind of driving both awareness and actioning against those results so that, you know, the system and, and owners and whatnot, business owners act on those results. And then you kind of have this, this interesting spectrum. And then on the other end of that spectrum is, you know, hair on fire, log four J is vulnerable. Where is it? And what are we doing about it? And, or, you know, insert the, you know, the CBSS score 10 hair on fire vulnerability du jour. Um, and what happens is a lot of security operation centers end up becoming the default apparatus for driving that because they have both the expertise to understand the vulnerability, the threat, find out where the vulnerabilities exist in the enterprise and notify a bunch of people about it, which sounds scarily similar to all many of the other incidents that they handle. So, you know, what to do and, and where do you draw that line between um, emergency investigation and notification and routine? And that looks that looks different for different folks. I think probably one of the most 
um, important things to point out is, is wherever you draw that line and however you're structured, you're going to need to have that routine communication and collaboration between the SOC and other, that other entity. And you're going to see this pop up all over the place. Um, sophisticated SOCs and large enterprises will end up having a Rolodex. Uh, sorry, that's an old term. I've been doing this too long. <laughs> a list of contacts that ends up being very long, even in even in modestly sized enterprises. I digress. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think there's there's two pieces here. So one is, um, you know, are the two pieces informing each other? So it's less about do they have to be together and more about are they doing that communications? Yeah. And so if if your vulnerability you know management team is informing your SOC and the SOC operations are informing vulnerability management doesn't matter where they're situated as long as they're doing that. Um, and then are they each able to do their mission effectively? You know, so vulnerability tends to be more on the prevention, more on, you know, it may be reactive depending on what's happening, but a lot of times you're trying to get ahead of things that are happening. The SOC has more of that, you know, detect and respond mission. So they're doing things that are more active, you know, so do you have things sitting in the queue for the SOC that are not getting done because you're doing scanning for something? Or are you scanning for things, but then you're not actually able to remediate because you need to turn around and go look at what's sitting in your queue on the SOC side? Um, and and all, a lot of that even comes into just the size of your organization. And so if you're a smaller organization, you might have these things you know, more grouped together and you're doing those trade-offs of where you're going to find you know, the importance of them. If you're a large organization, you might be able to have separate teams um, and be able to focus on them. And then you need to focus on the communications that goes between them. And Catherine, I'm sorry, I started talking over you. Yeah, no worries. Um, so I was just going to add that the, the the connective tissue between vulnerability management and SOC is about prioritization. So as something is happening in an incident, that should be a priority to the vulnerability management team if it involves a vulnerability that's widespread. Um, and vice versa, if the, the vulnerability management is seeing this widespread vulnerability that hasn't yet been an incident, they should be informing the security operations just to give some connective tissue there. Yeah, I really like that pragmatic approach of, well, here's what the teams have to do. Are they doing it? Yeah. Because <laughs> if they're not doing it, that might be the sign that maybe something needs to be adjusted here, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Especially if communications are the issue, right? If you find that things are waiting in inboxes, waiting in queues, or, you know, people aren't communicating, and that's the, the root of the problem. I think, you know, in my mind, that's a pretty clear indicator that, hey, maybe it's time to look at the org chart and get these people working closer together, right? Yeah. Um, one of the other questions that came to my mind is kind of about the other things lower down the list of, of SOC functions, the situational awareness, the comms, the training, leadership and management. Uh, could you speak a little bit to that? part of the list are those dedicated roles or is that something that's more of a it has to get done but it might not be a dedicated role like vol management or being a SOC analyst is yeah the, this is one of those areas we we really went back and forth on because many of these are not dedicated roles they are things that you yeah. do within you know like metrics you should be doing across all of your different teams you know management gets involved individuals get involved everybody gets involved but we started to put them in a paragraph and they were like, they are too important. You know, you have to have these top of mind. You have to make sure that they are addressed. Um, and that's, that's why we put them into the table because they are functions that you need to make sure that are taken care of, even if uh, your organization doesn't have somebody dedicated to it. Now I have been in large organizations that have had like a dedicated metrics person. That is their entire job. Their job is to figure out what's happening, how to translate it, how to improve on it, how to do, you know, score things, everything else. Um, but we recognize most socks, that's not going to be the case. Um, but did, did want to call them out and make sure that people had those, you know, in their descriptions somewhere of somebody's job. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's one of the things that very well meshes with my experience as well. We've, we've kind of have some things that are distributed amongst people, but that has to get done. But a little, you know, some people do a little bit of all of it. Uh, at one point we actually did have like an incident manager that was just a dedicated person that would disseminate, you know, what was the SOC doing today and things like that. And that worked really well too. Right. So there's a whole bunch of different approaches kind of even on that level. So I definitely wanted to kind of bring that out as well as there's a number of ways of approaching even that part of the problem. The next part of chapter zero was just kind of about SOC basics. And 
it gets into a little bit of the workflow of the SOC, right? We talked about mission before and saying like, hey, they stop cyber attacks, right? But in this section, you start to lay out a little bit of uh, what you call tip-offs to response. So could one of you speak a little bit to like the, what is a SOC doing at a very high level from receiving alerts to dealing with the problems and the things that maybe happen in between? Is there a way to break that down and start to think about what are those more individualized steps in that process? Once again, we're probably all quiet because that is such a big question. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll start. I mean, there's a bunch of analogies here that that a lot of people use. You're not usually going to get very far in a conversation about the kind of daily business rhythm or ops tempo of a SOC without talking about things like kind of that downward funnel. Everybody talks about the downward funnel of of um, of data to cases. And this goes back to the conversation about um, the definitions. And that goes from, you know, data, people, people like to say this different ways, from, from data to events, to alerts, to cases, to incidents. Um, and we kind of talk through that. Um, and, and we show the different parts of the SOC interacting. And, and one of the things you'll hear me say probably at least five times in, the, in this series of these um, of these episodes that we're going to do is uh, how necessary it is for the people doing this, participating in this funnel to be communicating and collaborating uh, pretty much on a daily basis. Um, you know, especially when we go from, you know, billions of, of observables um, to the small number of cases that are of, of major significance. And, you know, people ask me, why do you like doing security operations? And I say, I give them lots of different answers ranging from, well, I sometimes enjoy being going Mach 2 with my hair on fire and I don't have much hair left, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but one of the reasons why uh, I, I enjoy working in security operations is the sense of uh, fraternity and camaraderie um, that a group of people get when they're oriented against a threat. Um, I think Catherine mentioned this earlier, right? Is is, is that orientation towards um, kind of a common outcome, which is one of the reasons why I see these groups come together so much. And it's so great to see. It's so great to see. So, um, you know, that that daily rhythm of turning all of that data into business outcomes, I think is what, what makes SOX distinct from a lot of other cybersecurity business functions. Yeah, and as you're thinking about that that process of how you go through, um, and this goes back to the definitions we were talking in the beginning, like, you know, for the book, we say, okay, an event is like any observable occurrence, you know, within a system or a network. And so that's kind of the first thing is, hey, something happened. There's no good, there's no bad, there's no, um, you know, knowing whether it's something that you have to act on or yet, you know, not, it is just something that that happened. And so you're probably capturing that, you're going to put it into your tools. Um, and then you're going to figure out, okay, you know, is there something more here? And so we use the term alerts. You know, those are things where you've actually gone into that event and you said, okay, because of what we know, because of what we expect to be normal in an environment, what we've learned through threat intel, something else, like, is there, there a notification, um, you know, that, that something has happened? Um, you know, so it kind of picks out from from that environment. And we talk a little bit about in the book about like contextual sources. So things that are like your your logs or your your media memory images that are things that are just kind of there versus, you know, like something where your machine learning has gone in and actually said, hey, there's something here that's different than we expect. And so that's kind of something you can act upon. Um, and then from there, you're going to take all of that and figure out, OK, do we actually have something that is, um, you know, uh, elevated to an incident, you know, and Carson threw it a couple other steps here. There are a lot of other terms that you can use, but you're really trying to move through that funnel of, we have a whole bunch of stuff over here that happened. Okay. Now we put some, we're starting to put some context on top of it. Then we're trying to go through, we also use the term triage, which is that process of trying to evaluate all of those things that come in. And then you're trying to say, okay, out of those, you know, 10,000 events that were there, this one is actually an incident. We, you know, it is not something that we actually want going on. This is something we need to go deal with. And so there is that whole funnel process. There are all of these different pieces um, and a lot of other terms that I haven't mentioned uh, that, are, that are in our definitions and part of the book too. Um, and things we're talking about more as we get into uh, later strategies about incident response, about um, kind of data collection and tools and technologies and whatever. 
So yeah, and one of the more recent um, kinds of data that we've been drawing into: how do you do this workflow, and how do you insert some uh, reality into whether something's an event versus an incident? Is using cyber threat intelligence or CTI. So knowing a lot about your adversaries before there's an incident can help. Like what's really going against your mission, um, who's out there, what groups, um, what kinds of threats do you have to think about ahead of time? And this will help with that workflow and being able to run through that funnel over time. Yeah. And automation. That's something we hit on briefly here in Fundamentals, but we'll bring up in other chapters as well, is obviously um, we all know there's a skill shortage within cybersecurity. We all know that you know adversaries continue to throw everything they can at us. Um, so how do we use automation? How do we use technology to make that process faster as well? Uh, not something we need to dig, dive deeply into today, but definitely for you know the listeners' minds, just keep in mind that we're, we're going to be covering all these topics uh, as we go through the other strategies. That's right. Yeah. And I think we talked about doing automation early in the process. Yeah. Yep. I'll, I'll, offer, I'll offer two additional points here. We could talk about like just this question for hours um, and I'll hold myself back. There's two things I wanted to mention. One of them was uh, one of the things that is is surprising to people approaching this whole topic anew um, is how little confidence we have in so much of our data, in particular alerts, right? Anyone who's gotten spent any time in front of any of the tools that we'll talk about um, will you know quickly realize is, oh, most of what I'm being presented with is not actually bad. Um, and the way I like to turn that on its head, and I'm I'm quoting an old an old work associate of mine, is much of what our job is answering questions with data, and that's one of the things that makes this this thing we call security operations so exciting is it's it's constant puzzle solving, and everything that gets in our way of puzzle solving can seem like a frustration. Ask me how I know, and that everything that enables us it makes us happier. Um, and the other thing I'll mention in that though goes both to this downward funnel. And one of the earlier questions you asked, John, was, um, as we've gone along as an industry for the last over, over 25 years now, and as individual socks mature, they realize, and we talk about this in, in strategy four is, um, there's many different personas and roles and areas of expertise in the sock. And it feels a lot more like, a sports team where a lot of people have different nuanced expertise than, um, well, you know, you're just an analyst, right? Well, guess what? You know, folks, there's a lot of different ways we break that up in the, in the sock and it, it makes it really exciting, especially when you bring that diversity of backgrounds to a given incident. Yeah. Yeah. All good points. Um, there's a lot of things that go into this. And I, I know one of you had mentioned, uh, you know, in the notes uh, that we were prepping for this episode that you wanted to point out that there are some, some really important diagrams just in this chapter zero kind of section here and, and said that, um, you wanted to make the point it's it's not just a set of technologies, but more of a, a system, right? And something that's not necessarily 100% ground truth. I don't know which one, one of you had wrote that note, but could you just expand a little bit more on on that for those who might be flipping through chapter zero with this and kind of see those? Uh, yeah, that was something I was thinking about. So we've got two diagrams in the book um, that talk through, one of them starts to talk through the data that comes in and kind of how it goes to those tools and technologies. But then we've got another one, and I'm trying to look here, it's uh, page 25, um, that really shows that system um, and really brings the people into it and talks about how, how these different teams work together. Um, so, you know, how does CTI actually play with what you're doing? What about your system administrators? I mean, they're going to be a huge part of, you know, your response, you know, element of this. Um, how does feedback go into this? How do you do lessons learned? How do you learn over time and incorporate that? And so we really wanted to highlight that, um, especially if you're new, that is a great diagram to take a look at and then kind of have next to you as you're starting to think through some of these other strategies, because you can go, okay, you know, when we get to the chapter on, uh, on data or on tools, like, okay, that's this portion of it. But we have a whole chapter that's talking about, you know, people and, and organizational structure. Okay, how does that fit in? Uh, and we, we talk about something like, you know, we have later on talking about um, like, you know, malware analysis or something. OK, that's this piece here. So we just I wanted to make sure to highlight that that's a great diagram for people that are getting started to be able to just take a look at, have some terms on there, 
you know, write notes on it, keep it with you um, and build from that as you learn things over time. And that's figure three. Awesome. Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, super useful, especially as we go through these episodes to call out any diagrams that you think are particularly important and we can kind of talk people through and then hopefully people are able to kind of flip through and listen at the same time and, and follow along with us. So great stuff. Um, the kind of final section of this this first chapter here was uh, titled People Process and Technology at Speed. And what I wanted to bring up here was you talk about ops tempo. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what do you mean by the phrase operations tempo and why that's important? I, I'll, I'll take a crack at this. And we're, we're kind of wandering a little bit into strategy one and, and situational awareness. Um, uh, so I'll be brief. Um, the SOC... It's people, it's processes and technologies, you know, are a bounded set of resources. Whereas both the enterprise and the threats together can seem at times unbounded. So we're constantly making choices about how to expend those resources um, with increasing efficiency and effectiveness against what seems like an unbounded problem. Um, and you know, everything from, you know, the MITRE attack framework to the incident types uh, that we've chosen to say are important to us um, helps us break those problems down and understand which parts to attack first. So that that ops tempo, you know, is a term that I use and others use to talk about, like how many uh, events, alerts, cases, um, pieces of forensic evidence, um, pieces of CTI, news items that you're getting every day, and and how are you moving that, you know, through the funnel? Um, because the point of all of this is that, and this is what makes the SOC kind of unique as a cybersecurity op cybersecurity function, is um, it has to maintain or uh, attempt to maintain some kind of parity inside the decision loop of the adversary. And that can seem like a very daunting task. And so much of what we talk about in the book is helping the SOC make progress towards that understanding that that too is a moving goalpost. Yeah, I can give like a example of what I think of when I hear the word ops tempo. Um, you know, we have these stand-up meetings in a lot of security operations. Um, so it would be like, I don't know, 15 minutes First thing in the morning, everybody who's there would, would stand around and we'd all go over what's going to happen for that day. Mm. Who's working on what? How are you parsing out what's happening? What has to happen absolutely today versus can happen another day? So that's I, when I hear the word ops tempo, I just hear exactly that. You know, it's mm. how are you working? Yeah. So, and how can you make that faster? Is that a training issue? Is that a technology issue? Is it you have playbooks that allow people to know how to respond? You know, are you using your threat intelligence to get ahead of, you know, understand the adversary sooner? All of those types of things come into play in terms of trying to increase that speed to be able to react faster. Yeah, yeah. All great points. Um, I love, Catherine, what you said about the, um, you know, bring in the accountability part of it and the prioritization and and just kind of continuous improvement, really, kind of as a theme uh, for that as well. Those are all really, really crucial things for building up a really, you know, well-functioning SOC team. Um, one thing I love asking is, like, how do we measure that? Is there some metric that comes to your mind? Is there some sign of like, oh, our ops tempo is the problem, right? Like, what are you looking at as a kind of numeric number, if, if such a thing is possible, or at least for part of ops tempo? Uh, what might be a sign of, of a high or a low ops tempo? Oh, we have an entire strategy on metrics. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but a few things that come to mind for me are... Um, are you able to effectively respond to the inputs that your SOC is receiving? You know, so it, whether that is things coming down from your leadership and questions they're asking, or whether that is, you know, these events and alerts that are coming in and are you able to triage them and, and process them in enough time? Um, you know, so all of that is really looking at, are you able to do the things that you're supposed to be able to do and do them in a time frame? Um, that minimizes the incidents that, that you're actually having to respond to. Gotcha. 
All right. Um, so to close it up, I think that kind of covers most of chapter zero. Uh, you know, some takeaways in my mind are just thinking about your SOC mission and is it very clear to you how you operate, why you're doing what you're doing. And we're going to get deep into that kind of in chapter one when we talk about priorities and situational awareness and knowing your data, knowing your users and all of that. Um, but that's something I think uh, uh, listeners could walk away with from this one, as well as the functions, right? Um, thinking about what is and is not part of your SOC and does that make sense? Or is there a more optimal configuration? Uh, thinking about operations tempo and whether that is where they want it to be and how they might move in the right direction. Is there anything else that uh, you would like to point out as like a, a core important kind of piece of this chapter uh, for people to kind of take away and just think about before they listen to the next episode? I think it's something you're going to hear from all of us throughout the uh, the discussion, which is uh, the, the phrase "it depends," <laughs> and that there is there is no single uh, answer to what a, you know. There there is a core set of things that that most socks do, but beyond that, um, there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of opportunity, and really, it is um, going back and taking a look at that function list and identifying what your organization as a whole needs to do and what then your sock should be focused on. Um, and we actually will talk about this a little bit more when we get into the, I think it's strategy four on kind of organizational models and what different models may want to um, have as some of their functions. But it's really understanding what the scope of your organization is trying to do and then making sure what your SOC does versus what others do. Perfect. All right. Well, I think that's a great time to wrap it up then. So thank you everyone for joining me today. I uh, really, really appreciate the time you're all taking to do this, especially on a Saturday. Uh, I know those listeners wouldn't know that, but we were doing this on a weekend because we all love talking about this stuff. So uh, really, really appreciate giving us your, your crucial weekend hours where you could otherwise be out with your family doing stuff, but you're here talking with us uh, about security. So uh, for the listeners, in the next episode, we're going to be covering chapter one, and that is going to be know what you're protecting and why. Uh, some really, really important stuff for setting out objectives and priorities right from the start. Uh, absolutely crucial piece of getting security operations correct. And so stay tuned to that. We're going to be um, uh, releasing this episode both on all of our podcast streams as we have before. And if you uh, didn't catch this in our pre-announcement, we're actually going to be putting out videos for these episodes as well. So anyone that would rather watch this or listen to this on YouTube, we're going to have the videos available for the first time as well. So thank you everyone for listening and watching, and we will see you again on the next episode of Blueprint.